development of that particular speciality yeah i think that, that should be fine uh, nirmala yeah yes that will be fine i think so yes yes anything if you coordinate with the hod and the other professors of the department then they can mobilize the students as well as they can make them free uh, even though they have some or other uh, uh, programs okay so certainly be better we'll, i think so yeah we'll do like that we we'll need not do, do like in a hurry way but it has to be sustained means we have to go at some somewhat slow and uh, that should be sustainable forever okay certainly we'll take these points and we'll do welcome to dr ashok kumar uh, really a pleasure to see you sir and uh, uh, savita can you make siva can you make dr ashok kumar a host sure sir i'll do it sir yeah i think it's yeah. thanks um all of you can before we start the meeting can i add uh, to what dr nirmala just said yes sir um to avoid any um glitches and to avoid any steps what we have to take to start the webinar um especially when you're not there um most of the webinars are going to be started by you uh what uh, um we are trying to create uh, with the somi team is a cheat sheet or a checklist uh what we um use in most of the uh, uh formative meetings um so they will check oh i have done this yes i call this hod yes i have done this so it will make sure that we are not missing any steps um and it, it, i will i will i'll be i just saw that one which was created and i will send that to dr nirmala dr geetanjali and to you uh, to see what you think about it if you want to if you would like to use it in the future or um mainly for those who are not used to um doing a webinar you are a expert in it and you you are going to do this most of the most of the webinars but for those who are not familiar with it uh, we do have a standard procedure so they won't miss a step sure sir um thank you so much and the time is uh, 4 not 3 pm so yes. shall we start the proceedings and i hand over the proceedings to the moderator of this session professor Uh, Dr. Geetanjali uh, of the Department of Pediatrics at the Coimbatore Medical College Hospital to run us through this and make it a very very uh, enlightening uh, webinar. Over to Dr. Geetanjali. Thank you, sir. So it's a very warm welcome to one and all today. Is it visible, sir? I've yes. just projected the bio data of the speakers. Yeah. A warm welcome to one and all today. It's really a red letter day. where there's a conglomeration of great minds across the globe to instill confidence to the younger generation to achieve excellence in their respective areas of interest we are shortly going to begin the first webinar session under the aegis of the cnc global doctors alumni association the topic being how to read a journal article by two eminent speakers who are our own distinguished alumni now i I invite Dr. Ashok Kumar to give a brief presentation of global alumni activities in the next two minutes. Professor Dr. Ashok Kumar graduated as MBBS in nineteen seventy seven from Kanpur Medical College. Then he took up a course in the U.S. Army School of Aviation Medicine and underwent flight surgeon course. He is a fellow of Pulmonary Medicine, diplomat in American Board of Internal Medicine. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan as brigade surgeon. He is a recipient of several awards of high credentials. I will invite Dr. Ashok Kumar to share his thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Gidanjali, and good evening to um, all. It is a great pleasure to be here with you virtually for the first webinar of the Global Alumni Association, brought to you by Dr. Balavankit and Dr. Ramalingam. It is an honor to be in the same <laughs> forum where Dr. Lakshmi and Dr. Sheshadri are the faculty. the two academicians i respect and admire the most my special thanks to dr nirmala dr geetanjali and dr prabha for participating and we have the faculty in administration i see the beginnings of the bright future of the alumni and college faculty yeah get some notes for the alumni association is just 3 months old and not yet fully formed to be ah. intentionally intended extent in this short time the association has Forge a good collaborative relationship with administration and faculty. We will still strive to make this relationship better 
uh, more inclusive. We are not there yet, but working hard at it. We completed our first project, the e-library, and the SimLab should be a reality soon. To implement standard, standard of care in stroke management, a team from the alumni and faculty are reviewing the current processes and planning to implement an improved process at the hospital. This is a pilot project. From lessons learned from this project, we will plan on several other process improvement projects at the hospital. The academic committee has been working hard and this webinar is the first of the many to come organized by that committee. Through the SOMI, also called the Social Media Website Development Committee, we have established a website and registration for membership is open to all alumni. Many enthusiastic alumni members have submitted suggestions for future projects. We have also heard from the faculty and students several suggestions. A project review committee has been established. They will review these suggestions without bias based on a sound model of analysis and will prioritize the projects for implementation, all with the collaboration of the administration and faculty. And the whole process will be very transparent for everybody to see. The topic discussed today is a great opportunity to use as a springboard to start a journal club. If you don't have one, most of you do have one. Today's webinar will give you an opportunity to make it a more fun and meaningful one. My appreciation to Dr. Pranav, Dr. Sonia, and Dr. Himalada for being the panelists. Thanks again and best wishes. Thank you, sir, for that uh, brief, oh, wholesome overview of our uh, global alumni activities. Now it's time to add spice to this event by inviting our beloved and respected Dean, Professor Dr. Nirmala, to share her thoughts and give her remarks. Good evening to all. It's my pleasure and privilege to be a part of this global alumni in, uh, for the upliftment of our institution to your greatest heights. So uh, what I mean to say is, uh, indeed, I, it's a pleasure for me to invite the well, uh, renowned uh, personalities, Dr. Seshadri sir and uh, Dr. Lakshmi ma'am, for our uh, students to get benefited for the upcoming journal uh, review uh, journal uh, club and uh, it's indeed a pleasure uh, to see you all for this as uh, in the global alumni and i also thank ashok sir and uh, balavengat and uh, ramlingam sir uh, for having arranged such a wonderful pro program for the benefit of our students and uh, i think what i mean to say as already i, sp uh, I have spoken to you about the how it should go so what I suggest is it should go through, if it goes through our, uh, our HODs, it will be, uh, I mean, what to say, it can be sustainable forever. So I want all, all the alumni to coordinate with our HODs and if any program is conducted uh, in the future, it should, if it is go, uh, if it is by, uh, I mean, uh, if it is, uh, done by our professors and uh, if it is coordinated by the alumni, it will be better, I think so. Uh, so I wish every uh, aspect it should come up well. And uh, we are all for the of having the same mind. And indeed, uh, we all are going towards the same ca cause, but the, we have to coordinate ourselves and uh, as an administrator, I may find it very much difficult if uh, our people are left out. I frankly uh, admit that. And uh, if you, uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, indeed a, so we'll go ahead by that. And I wish uh, the global alumni all the very best in the future. And uh, it should come up well. And it is my, because it is started in my career, I want it go for a long time. And uh, with all your cooperation, I think we can make it. Uh, that's all to say. Uh, have a good day and uh, wish, wish you all, uh, wish my wish all my students uh, the very best and they, they can make use of this platform for their uh, updation. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, madam.
today i had seen been with you to see how busy you had been all along and i just we just stole a few moments to talk to you about this webinar or upcoming webinar of today as well as the hemophilia and such other things and uh, so it is our pleasure and privilege to have this done under your able guidance and uh, you are above all called and known to all alumni globally as not only an able surgeon and an able administrator but also the newly titled covid buster thank you ma'am next i invite dr balavenkat co-chair academic committee to say a few words dr balavenkat belongs to 1982 batch of kandathur medical college he took his diploma in anesthesia from bj medical college pune and further pursued his mt in anesthesia from pgi chandigarh now present he is working as a senior consultant anesthesiologist and academic director department of anesthesia and peri operative care at ganga hospitals kaimbatore over to you sir um, thank you so much professor geetanjali i consider it is a privilege and honor to be a part of the first academic session which the global alumni would want to do in association with the all the departments of Coimbatore Medical College Hospital and Coimbatore Medical College. I thank Dean Nirmala for being very proactive and supportive in the march towards making every postgraduate and undergraduate who is coming out of Coimbatore Medical College who could compete with possibly the best in the field across the globe. And it's such a rare opportunity to have distinguished and very experienced professionals from across the globe helping to support uh, the youngsters in making them the best so thank you dr nirmala for this and on behalf of the chairman of the alumni uh, dr ashok kumar and the co-chair of the academic committee dr amlingam i sincerely thank uh, the two doins of uh, the medical fraternity of india dr seshadri and lakshmi seshadri for being with us today willing to share their time and their expertise to make the young minds think about the way they need to read a journal article and to progress which i think is one of the most important step in medical field to acquire the necessary evidence based knowledge which will get converted into very good uh, clinical uh, work and implementing all that you read to your patients to make them as comfortable as possible when they are with us under our care so without much ado i have uh, great pleasure in thanking all the young post graduates the three panelists who come forward to share the stage with such doings in fact i was telling seshadri sir i wish i was a post graduate of coimbatore medical college to get all these nice incentives unfortunately when we were students we never had an opportunity to have or share or rub shoulders with doings it's a great beginning and i look forward for a bright future we will work hand in hand every every uh, points that was that were raised by dr nirmala has been noted and i'm sure in the forthcoming webinars we make it a point that all that she said is uh, made uh, possible and we will work together to make it a very successful meeting thank you so much dr geetanjali for moderating the entire session today and I, uh, before i conclude i wanted to sincerely thank sonosite india for giving us this platform where even 1000 people can participate and they will continue to support us in our venture in the coming webinars i thank savita and siva who are representing sonosite india in today's webinar please do convey our regards and sincere thanks to your entire organization over to dr geetanjali thank you sir with so much coordination amongst ourselves i think we can do a good job and have the sustainability in the long run for this good useful venture for the younger generation now it is my pride and privilege to in to although both the speakers do not need any introduction it is customary to project their biodata for the knowledge of the youngsters
un'arma che la mi cosa mi Dr. Seishadri has been the former professor and head department of endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism at Christian Medical College Hospital, Vellore, Tamil Nadu, consultant physician and endocrinologist, honorary director now at Thirmale Mission Hospital, Ranipet, Vellore. He has established the Department of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, Medical University, training in endocrinology and research at Christian Medical College Hospital, Vellore. He has trained 200 general medicine students and 20 trainees in endocrinology and metabolism. MBBS and MD examiner for a number of universities. DM, DNB, and PhD examiner endocrinology, Ames, New Delhi, PGI Chandigarh, KM Mumbai, and a host of other universities. And he's an inspector for DNB endocrinology. He's got more than 120 publications in national and international medical journals and invited for over 200 lectures and reviewer of many journals across the world. ICMR Research Award for work on metabolic bone disease, annual research day oration at CMCH Vellore, Scott Rangarajan Memorial Oration, Sundra Medical Foundation, Chennai Award, December 2018, and several other awards to his credit. Scott Lifestyle Achievement Award of AACE and SVIMS Tirupadi. Now over to Mrs. Lakshmi Sheshadri. Former professor in HOD Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, CMC Vellore. Currently senior consultant in Obstetrics and Gynecology at Tirumalai Mission Hospital, Ranipet Vellore. Has got more than 50 publications in index journals and has authored certain chapters in textbooks, especially in Essentials of Gynecology and Essentials of Obstetrics. The co-editor of Practical Guide to Obstetrics. Has given orations in various Conferences, areas of interest are gynae oncology and menopausal medicine, currently working at community level screening for cervical cancer, management of obesity and its complications are at other pet programs, as well as screening for postmenopausal osteoporosis. So now we go into the scientific session. I'm going to I'm going to start the session. Can I share my slide? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, if you stop, okay. I would like to say a few words. Dr. Hemalata is third year PG MD anesthesia. Her special interest is pediatric anesthesia. Dr. Sana Farhan is MS Obstetrics and Gynecology PG. Her special interest is pelvic surgery. And the third is Dr. Deepa Kishore, third year PG of MD Pediatrics. And his special interest is in hematology, pediatric hematology. Now, over Professor Dr. Lakshmi. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I think uh, both Seshadri and I are honored uh, to be asked to give the do the first uh, academic session of the alumni, uh, CMC alumni group. And uh, what we have chosen to do today, that is how to read a journal article. This is something that is um, important to all of us as clinicians and those who work in basic science uh, departments because every, I mean, it's very essential for us to keep ourselves updated. And every now and then you need to read in depth about something, maybe a clinical situation that you come across. Well, most of us turn to books, but as, um, uh, as a reference, books are all right because uh, they give you a width, but they do lack in depth on a particular focused topic. And they are updated only once in five years or so. Therefore, if you want to know in depth about anything, you need to turn to journals. 
when you turn to journals we have a lot of a uh, lot of them available um, when we were a postgraduate students any journal uh, any article that we came across i think we just swallowed everything hook line and sinker because we thought every study is fine every outcome is fine until such time when people started you know the talking about the kinds of um, uh, studies to be done and the uh, people started talking about how to conduct research what kind of study how it should be planned and also how to critically you read an a journal and uh, absorb or be able to say whether it is good or bad and absorb the uh, conclusions and and make our own interpretations moreover when you do go to a um, when you decide to do uh, uh, say ref some referencing and want to read a journal we have so much available you go to google and say let us all for ovulation induction there are 35800 articles and we actually should be able to sift it out and take out only the the good ones and get the wheat from the uh, differentiate the wheat from the chaff and chaff and therefore we need to know how to go about it so which journals to choose is the first one those that cover large areas credited to publish good information or high impact factor good peer review process and those who are which are willing to accept mistakes if there are like the british medical journal the lancet any jm annals of internal medicine any other renowned journals in your own specialty depending on whether you are a pediatrician or an obstetrician or whatever and for basic sciences there are other journals which are of uh, you know usually which are um, referred to and are considered to be the uh, prominent ones how after having decided on which journal to read how do you choose an article so we always say look at the title and is it of interest to you is this what you are looking for then you look at the abstract people used to go straight away to the conclusions earlier but we know that now with the structured abstracts being available and have been made compulsory in many, in all these publications they do give you a lot of idea about what you are going to uh, actually come across in this article so does this arouse your curiosity who are the authors and their affiliations is it from a reputable group or an institution are the patients similar to those you commonly see is it in a setting similar to your practice setting and are the results uh, good enough to alter the way you practice and if yes read the article critically finally you need to accept the conclusion change your practice re and or reject the conclusions and await further studies that depends on what you come up with now when you read the article you the, you have to categorize the type of study first we know that evaluation of treatment modality or intervention and evaluation of a diagnostic test are what clinicians look for mostly and the causation of the disease and study on natural history etc the those who are uh, involved in basic research basically look at meta analysis of course comes immediately after the evaluation of uh, treatment modality and diagnostic test because it is something that all the where the, all the studies are put together and analyzed the questions that you need to ask when you read a journal are what questions did the study address the patient characteristics the sample size the intervention characteristics comparison of the group characteristics outcome characteristics and loss to follow up whether they are excluded or what have they done you need to first describe the research question since that's the first question you're asking who was the which is the population that is studied the intervention or exposure what therapy risk factor or the test they used comparison of with control what alternative to intervention outcome clinical functional economic evaluate the methodology critically appraise uh, the, the question of validity did the experimental and control group start out with a similar prognosis where the patients randomized was randomization concealed where patients analyzed in the groups to which they were randomized were the groups similar did the experimental and control groups retain similar prognosis after the study etc and follow up whether they were complete when you look at the results you look at the primary outcome look at the absolute differences or the actual numbers look at the odds ratio or risk ratio and what is the confidence interval and p value what is the summary of the primary outcome now after going through all this you conclude with your own decision about the utility of the study for your 
practice and resolve the case or the question with which you began. Of course, describe why you think the results can or cannot be applied to your patient or situation depending on the applicability or external validity. And if you cannot apply it, why you cannot apply it to your, your patients or should you modify it in some way so that it can be made applicable to your patients. Of course, list, list the strength of the study and the weaknesses of the study. So with, with all this in mind, we are going to, um, our students are going to present uh, five intervention studies today. And um, after they present each of these studies, uh, we will, uh, one of us will actually moderate and look at the uh, strengths, weaknesses, etc., and see how the article has to be analyzed. So shall we start with the, uh, Sonia, your I'm, I've stopped sharing. So Sonia, I want to start with your first article. Yes, ma'am, sharing. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd first like to start by extending our gratitude on behalf of all the postgraduates for giving us this opportunity. It is a massive learning curve for us. Uh, so I've been given the role to present three different articles, uh, which surrounds around the similar, to uh, which rotates around a similar topic. The first one being uh, a prospective study on the role of centchromin in regression of fibroadenoma. It was a study that was published in the Clinics and Surgery Journal not too long ago. It was published in June uh, in this year. Uh, a very quick introduction. Fibroadenoma, as all of you know, is a painless breast lump, which is commonly seen in young girls, which has a feature of spontaneously regressing uh, in 10 to 15% of the patients over a period of around six to 60 months, whereas the rest are managed surgically. Now, all these three articles deal with introducing a new non-surgical technique that has come into light for managing fibroadenomas that do not spontaneously regress which is a drug that has been synthesized in the Central Drug Research Institution in Lucknow called the Centchromin, which is nothing but a novel non-steroidal multifunctional selective estrogen receptor modulator. It is basically an oral contraceptive with no major side effects. Now, moving on to the study per se, the aim of this study was to study the role of Centchromin in regression of fibroadenoma it is a prospective study which was conducted on the patients that visited the outpatient department of Government Medical College, Patiala, during a two and a half period, to be precise, December 2015 to May 2018. 60 consecutive patients that came to the OPD were selected with, who belonged to the age group of 15 to 35 years who had a fibroadenoma ranging from two to five centimeters, which was diagnosed by a triple test. What is a triple test? Uh, it is a test that uh, comprises of a clinical examination, ultrasound, and an FMAC. This terminology will be used in the rest of the studies, hence uh, explained. Uh, I will summarize the exclusion criteria. As mentioned, the age and the size of fibroadenoma was considered. Uh, patients with other comorbidities, as well as patients who did not give consent, uh, were not included in the study. Uh, how the study proceeded was uh, all the patients underwent a complete general physical as well as ultrasound examination, following which they were administered centchromin at a dose of 30 milligram thrice weekly, very importantly, thrice weekly for a period of three months. And these patients were followed up and the size of their fibroadenoma was reassessed clinically as well as sonologically at four weeks and three months, that is at 12 weeks after starting the therapy. Now, these are the outcomes they have uh, estimated. Uh, they have, uh, the descriptive data they've given is, uh, says that the most common age group it was seen was 21 to 25. Uh, obstetric index was studied and found out that most of the patients that responded to treatment were nulliparous. Uh, previous intake of OCP pills did not really have an effect on the outcome. Uh, the response, the effect of Senkrumen to the fibroabnoma per se was assessed based on clinical examination as well as the radiological examination. Uh, early responders are the patients who had a complete regression and uh, around 83, uh, around 10% were found to have complete clinical resolution of the 
uh, tumor mass, whereas uh, around 30% had complete regression on uh, ultrasound imaging. Uh, the study did also assess the side effects of Senchromin therapy and was found to be very minimal or neglig negligible. Now, uh, the study has been, I have uh, done the critical analysis of the study and uh, from which I understand that uh, the title of the study uses uh, the term prospective study, which is slightly vague. Uh, a control would have been better for the study because you have an entity you're studying, which is fibroadenoma, which itself has a spontaneous regression rate of 10 to 15%. So a control would have given better results. No mention on how the sample size was calculated was provided in the study. Uh, I feel that the sample size was slightly inadequate because the following studies, um, because the following studies has a sample size of around 80 to 140 patients. So the sample size being 60 is slightly inadequate. Uh, the outcome of the study is mostly descriptive. They have really not um, analyzed the data and given us a statistical association, a significant association, which I think is very necessary if uh, I would take it into consideration of affecting my practice or, any, uh, or, or clinically using it. Also, uh, the study had a very short follow-up period compared to the other studies, which used a six-month follow-up period. Okay. If you want to stop sharing, I will go on to the yes. comments of this article, okay? Um, stopping. Now, can I unmute, please? Hello? Am I not, I... Yeah, am I not unmuted? Uh, uh, no, I was... Uh, uh, okay, you're talking. Yeah, I am Pichumani. I am a general surgeon. I belong to 77 batch. Uh, I am a professor of surgery at uh, one of the private medical colleges down south. I was in PhD medical college. Now, what do you think uh, would be the adequate sample size for this study? Um, can I, uh, I'm just going to give you a, give an analysis of that. So shall we discuss it after that? Will I yeah, okay? please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this is... Um, um, okay, this is the article that she read and they've called it a prospective. That, that was very well done, Sonia, because you looked at the fact that the sample size was not adequate, that there was no statistical analysis. Of course, it's not possible. Um, I mean, when you don't have controls, but, uh, and uh, you have actually um, uh, highlighted the negatives of the study as well. So why did I read this article? Because we had a patient with recurrent fibroadenoma and was just reading up to see if there was something new. And of course, it's from a medical college in India, you actually pointed out. And when I looked up the conclusion, um, as I looked up the uh, abstract, I found that out of 60 patients, 18 had complete response. So then I thought, why not? We read it. Now, if, if you actually look at the study, uh, they, uh, they've called it, it's a basically an observational study. There is not, I mean, it is prospective, but it's only an observation. Get this medicine and see whether it works or, or not. There is no comparison, there is no randomization, there is no other group here. Now, they have, um, if you look at it, there are 48 nulliparas and 12 paras women. And so the number of nullipara and multipara are not matched. And so you cannot compare the results. You know, of, uh, you know, between nullipara and multipara, you'll just have to say, overall, this is what they found. Similarly, yeah. the number who had oral contraceptives. But um, uh, the, the only relevant observation is brought out in this table, which where, where you can see that uh, as observed by clinical examination and by ultrasound characteristic, there is a mean uh, regression of about 44.6% and 53.53% 53 as a, on an ultrasound scan, 44 clinically. It is an important observation and this is the only important table there. They've got several tables because when you've entered the data and you touch off a button, you can have innumerable tables, but then whether they are relevant or not is what you need to look at. And um, uh, they have said the response based on parity uh, have, they have called it a pioneer observation, having had 48 in one group and 12 in the other group, and these are totally not comparable. So comments like this is a pioneer observation and that 
uh, you know, um, and um, uh, observations like uh, even those based on OCP should certainly not be made because they are not relevant. There is no statistical significance here. So what is the message here? Without nitpicking, what is the message? The message is that Senchroman has been shown to reduce the size of fibroadenoma in an observational study of 60 women. That's all. So can we start using it? Is the study useless? The answer is it's an interesting and clinically relevant observation. Do not throw it out of the window. It can be used as a pilot study for further research and a proper trial can be used for calculation of sample size. Because here you found that 30% have shown a more than 50% or complete response. And therefore, using that, you will be able to calculate a sample size for further studies is what I would basically say. Now I stop sharing and you can go ahead with your next uh, next uh, case discussion or next uh, journal article discussion. Sonia, now to answer the question that um, uh, you had asked, Dr. Pichmani. Hello. Uh, if I can, hello, if I can yeah. make a comment. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, a question was raised about sample size. You know, spontaneous regression rate at the most is 15%. And you know, in this study, they found a regression of about 50%. So I can use two, these two numbers to and use the scientific package and calculate sample size for a proper study. Go ahead, Sonia, with the next one. Yes. Um, the next journal we are uh, going to discuss about is uh, titled Regression of Fibroadenomas with Scent Chromin. And this one's a randomized control trial, which was published in the Indian Journal of Surgery in 2015. Uh, the aim of this study was to investigate the role of Senchromin in regression of fibroadenoma in comparison to natural observation and to study the association of hormonal receptors with the degree of regression. It is a randomized controlled trial, uh, also an open label to a um, parallel design RCT, which was conducted on the uh, patients that attended the outpatient department of uh, surgery in the following of medical sciences, Delhi, uh, for a three-year period, extending from November 2004 to 2007. Now, in this study, uh, around 80 patients that met an inclusion criteria, which is similar to the previous study, which is women less than 30 years having a fibroadenoma size of less than uh, five centimeter, uh, these patients were selected and uh, randomized into two groups. Uh, allocate, allot, allotted into a scent chromin group and into a control group. The patients in the scent chromin group were administered scent chromin daily, daily for a period of three months. Uh, please know that it was given daily. And these patients were followed up uh, with clinical and ultrasound examination at uh, 0, 12, and 24 weeks. Whereas the control group were also followed up and uh, uh, evaluated. Now, what is interesting in the study is that even though the sample size was 80, they had actually identified around 121 fibroadenomas on ultrasound and the fibroadenomas were more of the unit of study than the patient itself, by which I mean the results are based on the number of fibroadenomas and how they responded than the number of patients. Um, unlike the previous study, the patients in this study were followed up uh, up to a period of around uh, six months. Now, in the outcome of this study, uh, a complete regression was seen uh, in around 31 percentage in the Senchromin arm, whereas only 7% of patients had complete regression of fibroadenoma in the control arm, whereas around 52% of patients showed complete regression in the Senchromin arm with only 19% in the control arm. They also uh, found that the mean age of presentation was 22 years, which corresponds to our previous study. Now, an additional thing this study has uh, shown is that they have diagnosed the amount of uh, receptor, uh, estrogen receptor positivity in the fibroadenomas identified. And uh, what is interesting to note is that both ER positive as well as negative patients responded to Senchromin and the response rate was equal to up to 12 weeks. But 
the er positive patients showed a better response at the end of 24 weeks which will be only noted if the patients are actually followed up till the end of 6 months uh, i'd like to point out that in the previous study the patients were only followed up in until 12 weeks and hence they would have been missed now on critically analyzing this study uh, the because it is an rct it was analyzed with correspondence to the consort checklist the positive findings i thought were that the title describes the entire study it itself is declarative it says that there is regression uh, with the use of sent chromin for fibroadenoma and it is self explanatory they have in very detail mentioned how the sample size was calculated along with the power and the confidence interval um they have used both parametric and non parametric tests to assess the outcome data uh they have also used receptor analysis as an additional point and the study has an extended follow up period uh the negative findings i would say is that even though the sample size were 80 patients the outcome was based on the 120 121 fibroadenomas that were studied which is uh, not a disadvantage per se but makes it difficult for us to compare this outcome of the study with other studies um random allocation was uh, done in the study which is a positive effect uh, open label two arm parallel design but the level of blinding has not been emphasized on um also it did not mention on uh, how the patients who were lost to follow up were dealt with uh, that's all ma'am all right can you stop sharing and i'll come yes, up from no okay so we are getting better and better at it sonia as i can see uh, because um, you've been able to you know look at um, uh, more and more uh, positives and negative in the next article and um, uh, therefore i think by next article i think you will be an expert in this so this is a study on um, uh, This is a study on regression of fibroadenomas with centromin, and they have called it a randomized controlled trial. All India Institute, all of which she mentioned. The sample size was calculated, and they have done it. They have said that it is up eighty uh, percent power. Uh, compare it with that drug. Is this drug better? How is it better? How much is it better? Is what we would like to know because there is a spontaneous regression of almost fifteen percent, even if you don't do anything. But having asked this question, we do know that we don't have very effective. Uh, medical management for fibroadenoma and therefore it should be all right even to compare it with the placebo can we change our practice based on this i would say no why not a randomized controlled trial comparing the other drug bar placebo with proper blinding would really tell us whether it is a good drug or not and i perhaps would wait for that so i have discussed the strengths and the weaknesses of the study certainly better than the pre or i would say that this actually Uh, is some uh, study like this is what we would have undertaken if we had seen the first article and got this idea that oh here is a drug which is working on uh, fibroadenomas let us see uh, let us do a good study and see uh, calculate the proper sample size and see whether we can do a randomized control trial except that we didn't use a placebo in this one can i okay, can i I, can i just sharing. add a comment this kind of study is called yes. an open label study randomized yes. control but open label that means everybody knows patient knows treating physician knows sonologist knows so there is a possibility of bias in assessment of outcome you need to remember that and sonia called called it an open label she highlighted that open label one yes that was it's good that you noticed that sonia yes can we go on to the next one sonia yes ma'am share it Uh, so the third and the last study we're going to be discussing uh, in this uh, session is uh, a comparative study of efficacy of sent chromin and evening primrose oil in the treatment of benign breast disease uh, it was a study done in the year 2018 the aim of which is to compare the efficacy of sent chromin and evening primrose oil in treating breast pain with or without nodularity in patients with fibrocystic disease Uh, the second being to compare the efficacy of sent chromin and evening primrose oil in regression of smaller fibroadenomas the study design they mentioned is that it's a longitudinal study 
the sample size they included is uh, 140 out of which uh, patients were uh, classified as 82 patients who were already receiving. They took 140 patients out of which 82 of them were already receiving centchromin as a treatment as prescribed by their physician and 58 were on treatment with evening primrose oil. Uh, as I mentioned, all individuals who were put on treatment were either with centchromin or evening primrose oil by the treating surgeons and were included into the study. Um, uh, similar to the previous studies, all the patients included in the study underwent clinical and ultrasound examination of the breast and were administered centchromin uh, at a dose of 30 milligram on alternate days for three months and evening primrose oil at a dose of uh, 1000 milligram daily for three months. Uh, these patients were also followed up periodically until six months. Uh, and each visit, they were re-evaluated clinically as well as based on ultrasound, uh, ultrasound uh, parameters. Now, similar to the previous studies, uh, the parameter of age was studied in this, and most of the patients were uh, belong to the age group of 21 to 25. Um, the type of pain most of them complained uh, were cyclical, uh, the response to pain were better in the patients who received centchromin as uh, a treatment, which is uh, which notes a 52% regression, excellent response with 52%, whereas patients who were receiving evening primrose oil only showed a 12% uh, improvement. In the centchromin arm, 34% of the patients had a improvement in tender nodularity whereas in the evening primrose group, only 23% had an improvement. Uh, the upper lateral quadrant was found to be the most common site where fibroadenoma was found uh, to be present, and it was seen in a percentage of 15%. Um, in the sense, the, uh, considering this uh, volume reduction of the fibroadenoma, around uh, 16 11% of patients on centchromin had complete regression of the tumor of the mass, whereas uh, patients who were receiving evening primrose oil had only 6% uh, regression. That is, only one patient had complete uh, uh, regression of the fibroadenoma. Now, in this study, they have also calculated the odds ratio. The odds ratio for the above table is 14.46, which means the odds that centchromin will cause a more than 50% reduction in the lump size is 14 times higher than that in a patient receiving evening primrose oil. Uh, the study also addressed the adverse effects of uh, centchromin and the outcomes are similar to the previous studies. Now, on analyzing the study, uh, compared to the previous two studies, the study had a larger uh, sample size because of which the previous two studies had a regression rate of 30%. In this study, they have found a regression rate of around 40%, which is comparatively higher than the previous study. And because they have statistically analyzed the descriptive data, it makes it more clinically applicable. It makes it easier for a clinician to use it. Now, the negative uh, interpretations would be, uh, in the title, they have used the term, a comparative study, which is not a very statistical term. Um, the previous two studies have a regression of fibroadenoma as an objective which displaced in the title, which whereas in this title, they have used the terminology benign breast disease, which is slightly non-specific. Uh, the above study is an analytical study under which it can be uh, which under which it can be categorized as a cohort. The type of study is not very clearly mentioned in the study. No random allocation was done, thereby the findings were in in where thereby the findings are inferior to any other study where randomization is strictly followed. Hence, the result is uh, less uh, superior compared to the previous study. Uh, there is no mention about how the sample size was calculated. And uh, another feature is that uh, out of the three parameters studied, uh, pain, they actually used a pain score, uh, but mastalgia and nodularity were very subjective and was highly um, prone to bias, observer bias. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So if you will stop sharing. Yes, ma'am. Stopping. Okay. So that was, as I told you, you now become uh, an expert. Uh, 
in critically evaluating journal articles. So I'll just quickly go through this one um, to highlight. It's a they've called it a comparative study of efficacy, and they've looked at pain and fibrocystic disease and regression. So they're looking at multiple things, outcomes in the same study. The, the, they have said pain with and without benign breast disease, which is very, very vague. Comparing apples and oranges, sample size was not calculated, as you rightly mentioned. It's an observational study, and patients started either drug by the treating physician with no inclusion or exclusion criteria. If you look at the numbers, on Senchroman group, there is 23, and on the um, EPO group, there are 59 here, and the numbers are not comparable, as I told you. And here, they have made this mistake and called it 25. These kind of little errors in the table and publication cannot be uh, accepted. And um, uh, that really speaks for the quality or the, of the study or the lack of it. Uh, the statistical significance was not calculated. And for the more than 50% reduction, it is 48% and 6%, whereas they have said that the odds ratio is 14. Here, if you actually calculate it, it is only 8. So, uh, it is very important to make sure that these errors and uh, you know, uh, these mistakes are not there uh, in an article because other, it, it really uh, speaks for the quality of the article or the lack of it, as I said. So Senchromin is there in the discussion and conclusion, they have said that it is better than evening primrose oil in reducing pain, nodularity, et cetera, et cetera. But they have not... Um, really, as you said, not randomized, they have not taken equal numbers, they have not got exclusion inclusion criteria. So it's very difficult to compare. And uh, so can this change our practice? And uh, the answer would be um, no. So then what do we do? We've looked at three different studies. And I would say that the one that is con was um, done in All India Institute is probably the best, the second one, because there is some randomization, even though they did not use a placebo and it, it was an open label study. With this in mind, what can we do now? I think it will be as, a stu as students, as postgraduate students who are reading the journal article, this, we, this is the opportunity for you to plan a proper study using a proper uh, randomization and uh, a drug that you can compare with Senchroman to see whether this is of uh, much use or is not useful at all. And the actual yes and no answer would only come at the end of a much better or well-planned uh, study. I should also add that at the end of all this, uh, because there are no other articles and no other medical management, we ended up giving the drug to the patient and we are waiting to see what happens. That's a different matter altogether. Over to you, Seishad. Ah. Sorry, a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed that. What did you think about the journal? jmed.com, did you look up the journal? Oh. I think yeah, it's one of the I fundamental really things to know. It is one of those online journals which takes payment for publication and it doesn't have a transparent peer review process. So one of the fundamental roles in any journal article reading is to look at the journal. I think that would have given you some insight. Noted. And the second thing is they talk about odds ratio in a very loose way. Hmm. Not only is the odds ratio calculated not correct, they don't talk about a 95% confidence interval, which should always accompany an odds ratio for you mm. to say statistically significant. The way they use the statistical terms very loosely, the mistakes that are there at the tables in terms of numbers, and the quality of the journals that are published completely erode your confidence in this article. So you will discard this article. Yeah. The only article of merit is the R&D Institute article. You can calculate a good sample size and use a placebo control study and maybe one of the postgraduate in biomedical college can take it up as a thesis project. Hopefully. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, I think now, Seish, your, your article starts now. Okay. Deepak, uh, what we, yeah. Deepak, Deepak is sure. Sure. Yeah. Deepak, are you there? Yeah. I'm Deepak I'm or, uh, okay. Deepak is very well. Okay. Go ahead. This is what Pranav had. I think it is Deepak's presentation. Okay. Of yes. Her. That's correct. Yes. Uh, 
हेलो मैं ऑडिबल मैम यस अ स्लाइड विजिबल सर या या गुड इवनिंग वन ऑन ऑल प्रेजेंट हियर एक बिफोर स्टार्टिंग द प्रेजेंटेशन आई थैंक द डीन ऑफ आवर मेडिकल कॉलेज एंड माय एचओडी मैम फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू प्रेजेंट इन दिस फोरम सो द आर्टिकल टुडे आई एम रिव्यूइंग इज द इफेक्ट्स ऑफ एस्पिरिन फॉर प्राइमरी प्रिवेंशन इन पर्संस विद डायबिटीज मेलिटस सो दिस आर्टिकल was uh, published in uh, august 26 2018 at uh, new england yes so this was uh... hello am i audible ma'am hello you are audible you are audible wow. yeah. you are audible sorry for the interruption uh, so this article was published in the august 26 2018 at the new england journal of medicine so why was this trial conducted basically so what we already know so we already know that aspirin is useful in the primary prevention of coronary artery disease so this was uh, done by an anti thrombotic trialist collaboration which was a meta analysis study so but the pitfall of this study was that only the diabetes included in that study was only 4% another study showed aspirin reduces the incidence of gi malignancy it was done by a retrospective meta analysis study but the randomized control trials were not done so so coming to the study design of this article so this was a randomized control trial and was double blinded so it was taken into two into two factorial study that means uh, they had compared two drugs namely the aspirin and they had taken into account omega 3 fatty acid also and the study population was 15418 and they were followed up to a period of 7 and a half years 7.4 years so coming to the inclusion criteria all males who had either type 1 or type 2 diabetes mellitus above the age of 40 years were included in the study and those who had history of uh, mi stroke or arterial revascularization procedure which was recently performed or those who are already in aspirin warfarin or any blood thinning agents were excluded out so coming to the study design so the 15480 population was random initially randomized into four groups namely they were allocated to aspirin and omega 3 allocated to aspirin and placebo omega 3 placebo aspirin and omega 3 and placebo aspirin and placebo omega 3 so as the study progressed they found no use in omega 3 fatty acid so they discarded that part and they now included they restricted the study only to two groups namely the aspirin group and placebo aspirin group so these are the demographics of the study population they were uh, broadly stratified into two groups and uh, it was equally distributed the mean age was age was uh, 63 and the males were 63% and those with type 2 diabetes were 94% and the duration of uh, diabetic illness was around 7 years and hypertension was 62 uh, statin use was 76 in aspirin and placebo as you can see it was almost equal in both the aspirin and the placebo group so coming on to the outcome so what was the outcome of the study so the primary outcome they took into account was uh, non fatal mi or stroke or a recent uh, transient ischemic attack or any mortality from the vascular events the secondary outcome were the reduction in incidence of cancers or any other vascular events or any other uh, uh, events that warranted a revascularization procedure so we also took into account the adverse outcome so the safety outcomes that were uh, included in the study were any confirmed uh, intracranial hemorrhage or any significant uh, life threatening eye bleed or any other serious bleeding episode so these were the safety outcomes we had taken in top so this is a kitten mayer plot and uh, here in the y axis you can uh, see the participants uh, the participants with the uh, percentage with the uh, vascular event so these much of percent uh, percent uh, participants had a significant vascular event and uh, on the x axis we can see the years of uh, follow and uh, you can see the aspirin group uh, did uh, fairly well compared to the placebo group um, 
Yep. So this is another forest plot study. So here we had uh, the risk ratios, uh, the rate ratios were kept at 1.0 and those less than 1.0 meant that the aspirin group did better. And if it's more than 1.0 meant that the placebo group did better. So you can see, uh, so we had uh, stratified according to the uh, year of follow. In the first three years of follow, uh, when we did uh, the aspirin group did significantly uh, better and uh, the vascular events were significantly less in the aspirin group and in the three to five years also the aspirin group did well as the study progressed to five to seven years uh, the uh, placebo group seemed to do better it was not significant and in the seven up uh, to seven years also the placebo group uh, did better overall it's uh, the aspirin group did better uh, uh, with the rate ratio less than one. So one of the reasons for this was, so as you can see here, in the year of follow-up, uh, in the first 7,740 people were there. And uh, as it progressed, and at the end of seven years, it was only 1,430. And uh, as the study population also decreased, as the year of follow-up increased. Okay. Right. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, coming to the conclusion of the study, so the primary efficacy outcome was significantly lower in the aspirin group than in the placebo group with a significant p-value. But the risk difference is mainly seen in the first five years. And uh, I also attributed the reason for this because the as the year progressed, the sample population decreased. And uh, here you can see I compared the outcomes, vascular outcomes, and the uh, significant adverse event, the major bleeding. You can see the aspirin group uh, did uh, significantly better in the vascular outcomes. At the same time, they had also had a significant risk of major bleed. So uh, this was the uh, atherosclerosis cardiovascular study where they were. Uh, when the score was more than 20%, we used to start statins. Here, uh, the score of less than 5% and 5 to 10% and more than 10% uh, were compared. And uh, the aspirin and placebo were instituted. And this also showed aspirin did a significant uh, uh, reduction in the major bleeding, um, a significant reduction in the major uh, mortality outcome in the aspirin group. So this is the secondary outcome where uh, uh, the study of aspirin and uh, reduction of uh, GI, uh, uh, all the cancers are studied. So you can see that uh, there are no significant uh, p-values or confidence, there are sig no significant reduction in the cancer outcome after uh, adding, to adding of uh, aspirin. So the results are, so the conclusion is the aspirin group had a significant reduction in the cardiovascular risks in patients with diabetes on aspirin. And uh, it, though it increased the chances of bleeding in patients on aspirin, and there was no reduction in the cancer, cancer incidence. The strength of the study was it was an RCT study, it was double-blinded, and a stratified block randomization was done and was followed up. It was a long-term follow-up, and uh, they were followed up up to a period of eight years, and it was a large trial uh, employing a uh, population of 15,400. The limitations were the PPIs, proton pump inhibitors was used were not mentioned and uh, 100 milligram aspirin was used, whereas in our countries it was 75 milligram aspirin and the uh, intention to treat analysis was grossly underestimated. Thank you. That was uh... Very well done, Deepak. Very nice presentation. I will add my comments and then we can have a discussion at the end. Can I share my screen now? Yes, sir. Say sheets. Yeah, yeah, I got. Okay, uh, this is the article that we are talking about, the ASEAN group study. Look at the journal. 
it's a good journal, New England Journal of Medicine, fairly recent, 2018. As you mentioned, the type of study is a very good study, prospective, randomized, double-blind, classical controls. The best kind of study you can ask for. It was done with ethical approval, very important look at that. Informed consent was obtained from all participants. And there was a calculation of sample size that was based on a risk reduction of 15%. So they said, for us to pick up this 15% difference in risk, we need to study this many patients. And as you said, they had basically two arms which are being analyzed in this, aspirin versus placebo. There are some important patient characteristics that you should have pointed out. The majority of patients, nearly 76%, were on statin. That means the effect of aspirin demonstrated in this study is over and above what you can obtain with statin. Uh, there was a certain level of physician uncertainty in this large multicenter study about whether patients who were already getting aspirin, whether it was useful or not. So about 35.6% of patients who were already on aspirin were actually randomized into the study. When you do that, you have a subset of patients who are already on aspirin because they were equally distributed. But when this happens, you may underestimate the effects of aspirin that you are now using. Okay, a significant proportion were on aspirin before the commencement of the study. They discontinued the aspirin and they went into this randomized control trial. They had a very nice way of doing the study. There was a pre-specified analysis plan. They said, this is the way we are going to analyze. And an allowance was made for multiple comparisons. When you do multiple statistical tests, sometimes you find a difference where there is none because of the way statistics work. So they allowed for multiple comparisons. And as you very elegantly pointed out, no baseline differences and risk factors for developing uh, vascular events. Excellent duration of follow-up, 7.4 years. Mm -hmm. you know, how they held their patients together for that long a period of time was done by Oxford. The adherence to protocol was 70% in both arms. That means compliance with the medication was 70%. That's again phenomenal when you do a study of that duration. And adjudication of events was more than 90%. That means if somebody said you know, he had a myocardial infarction, a central adjudication committee goes through it and then says, yes, it is there or no, it is not there, based on the information made available to them. So central adjudication was more than 90%. These are all major pluses in the study. Now, I summed up the results here. The vascular event, the relative risk was 0.88. That means you are protected from a vascular event by about 12%. Okay? The 95% confidence interval, as you showed in your forest plot, is well under 1%. Therefore, it is a significant mm -hmm. They also present in their article the number needed to treat to prevent one event in 7.4 years. This is very important information for the clinician. You need to treat 91 patients each for a period of 7.4 years to prevent one vascular event. Vascular deaths, there was no difference between placebo and aspirin. So they died anyway. I mean, the proportion of people who died due to vascular causes were exactly the same between placebo and aspirin. So aspirin had no effect on mortality due to vascular events. Now, if you look at major bleed, that occurred 1.29. That means 29% more in the aspirin arm. And the 95% confidence intervals are well beyond one. So there is a significant increase in major bleeding. And they also mentioned the number needed to harm. That is, you need to use a drug in 112 patients for 7.4 years to produce one major bleed. Okay. Now, these are very important things for the clinician to make a decision as to whether he is going to accept and practice this or not. But you look at fatal bleeding, it is identical in the two groups. So, aspirin use had no effect on mortality but it had an effect on morbidity, both the plus and the minus. Plus in terms of reduction in vascular event and minus in terms of major bleeding. Now, this is the one that you showed as actually a graph, a bar diagram. I converted it into a table. Now, this is called an exploratory analysis. 
Now, this exploratory analysis is based on the assumption that the compliance is 100%. See, the compliance is only 70%, you get a particular result. You can extrapolate from the compliant patients to all the patients and then derive what it will be like if the compliance was 100%. This is what they have done in that bar diagram. And I want you to show so you've got uh, aspirin versus placebo with different underlying risk scores for cardiovascular disease. Less than 5%, 5 to 10, more than 10, right? Now, if you look at the bottom line, the benefit to risk ratio, that is number of vascular events versus number of bleeds, that actually becomes narrow, narrower when you extrapolate the results for 100% compliance, okay? So what they are saying is, if everybody had taken aspirin, the differences that they observed would not have been as much as they have presented in their article. They have been very honest about that. That is good. The another piece of honesty in this article, which I think you should give the uh, investigator the credit for, they did not include transient ischemic attacks initially as an endpoint. It was added as an endpoint a little later on during the process of randomization. But when they present the results, they present the outcomes as a composite outcome, vascular outcome, excluding transient ischemic attack. If you look at that, it is not actually significant. If you look at the vascular events, including transient ischemic attacks, then you get a significant difference. So they do acknowledge the fact that they made a change to the protocol and the impact of the change on the outcome. So they're being very honest. I think honesty is something that is a, a rare commodity. And when you come across it, you need to appreciate it. Right. Okay. That is about the study. And uh, on the basis of the study, the, it's a very strong study. You commented about the numbers becoming smaller as the years go by. That is because when you start off, you would have had only about 1,400 patients the first year. Those are the ones who can follow up up to seven years. Other guys who come in along the way will be followed up for shorter periods of time. And the authors do say in the end that they are planning to continue to the follow up these patients for a much longer duration. till. Everybody is followed up for 10 years. That information is currently not available, okay? But the dwindling in numbers is because of the time taken for randomization to this large trial. So that does not take away from the study. But the point they make that aspirin's benefit seems to be there only in the first uh, three years of use. I think that's an important point. That means it has its maximum effect when you start continuing for three years. But it's not as if you can stop it at the end of the time. Because if you stop it at the end of the time, the benefit might wane and your control arm, your, your arm which was, uh, you know, uh, not using aspirin will start having more and more events, okay? So this does not lead to the conclusion that aspirin can be stopped at the end of three years, but says that the benefit that accrues, accrues within the first three years. But you need to continue for you to maintain the benefit. The actuarial survival curve shows parallel, you know, Aspirin is better than the placebo, and the two lines are exactly parallel as you go along. Okay, those are my comments about this study. I think uh, we'll go on to the next study. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Uh, sir, uh, can you make me a voice, sir? I'm not voice eh? I'll stop sharing. Okay. Uh, I would request Hemalata to actually present the next study, which is on actually the same topic, but it's a different study. Okay, sir. Sir, I'm not hosted. Kindly make me a host, sir. Hello? Kindly make Hemalata as host here. Okay. You are already a co-host, Hemlata. No, sir. Uh, Hemlata Rajshagran, me, I'm, I'm not hosted. Yeah, yes, Hemla, sir. Hemlata Rajshagran Subayan shows as co-host, Mahia. Yeah? You just I'm start sorry, no, sharing. Yeah. yeah, just start, start sharing. Start. Yeah, that's it.
Hello. 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 Uh, uh, Gitanjali, do you have, have, uh, have, uh, have, have, have a Himla. connectivity problem? Yeah, they're calling her. They call her. Okay. If not, uh, do you have the summary of those uh, of the study? Okay. Your message. I can I can I can do a critique of the study if you want yeah. the summary. Yeah. But the thing is, but thing I think is it will be have the opportunity. Yeah. 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 Sir, can you hear me? It'll be it'll be yes. Sir, can you hear can me? Hear you. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, 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 sorry, yes, sir. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, share your screen. Yes, sir. Can every, anyone, everyone see, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah. So my study is on uh, low-dose aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular events in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. It is a 10-year follow-up study of RCT and they had a follow -up, followed up it using the cohort study coming to the abstract. So it studies the long-term efficacy of a low-dose aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular events in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. This Japanese people has conducted JPA trial, which is Japanese primary prevention of atherosclerosis with the aspirin for type 2 diabetes mellitus. And they had followed up and they have proved and concluded that the aspirin has no significant effect over preventing cardiovascular events. So the methodology which they had used is RCT for heart study. I'm sorry that it's not an open label. They had the, the uh, double blinding. And the settings they have did in various institutions and colleges in Japan. And the, uh, the credibility and reliability of the institutions and colleges are really good. And the study duration is of uh, about 10 years. So study populations, they had took around uh, uh, 2,539 people in, in which they had one group, they had uh, started on aspirin and another group, they had, uh, they had took it as placebo. Coming to sample size collection, how they had collected me. So they, they expected primary outcome of about 52 people for 1,000 uh, 1, people, 52 people will have a cardiovascular event. Estimating that and with the alpha at a less than 5% and the confidence interval of 95% and to deduct 30% relative risk reduction, they had cal uh, est uh, estimated this uh, 2,539 population will be adequate. This was during the start of study. And they had included the both inclusion exclusion criteria. They had included uh, uh, patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus between the age of 30 and the 85 years. And they had excluded all the people with the history of CAD, CVA and the peripheral vascular disease and the patients with ECG changes and any antiplatelet therapies and the AFs and severe liver or renal dysfunctions and the patients uh, who is allergic to aspirin. So they had did simple randomization means which they had alerted one is to one uh, they had alerted and they had obtained or uh, written consent for all, from all the uh, study and the placebo group and the blinding they had did double blinding. So this flowchart clearly explains uh, when they started uh, uh, study, they, they had started uh, uh, enrollment on 2002, they had finished on 2005 and they, they had followed up for 10 years. 10 years and they had uh, initially, sir, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hello, can Hello? somebody, can everybody mute the mic? Can you hear me? Ah. Uh, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. you're audible. 
Okay, sir. So they had took around two thousand five thirty nine patient in which they they had uh, attend two groups and in between the study, some people has discontinued the study and lost to follow up, and some people has to stop the study because uh, uh, this aspirin uh, has caused some bleeding complications. So they have to switch over from uh, this group to this group, and some people has to start on aspirin. So they have been uh, has been uh, uh, switched over from this group to this group. And here they had did two types of study. One is per port protocol analysis, and one is intention to treat cohort study. Both they had studied in detail, then they had discussed separately. So this is the baseline characters of uh, uh, the patients uh, belonging to the two groups. In this, all the uh, parameters have been matched except two things which I can notice is the du uh, median duration of the diabetes mellitus in the aspirin group is bit higher uh, than when, when we compare with the no aspirin group. And also, uh, this table shows the uh, drug therapies of the, the people which, uh, who are taking. In this, the statins uh, taken by the no aspirin group is much high, a bit higher than that of the aspirin group. So the outcome that they, they had expected is in, uh, first occurrence of the cardiovascular event, both during trial and the follow-up. So which may be a sudden death or death due to uh, coronary and cerebral vascular or aortic process and non with fatal acute MI, angina, or stroke, or TA, or, or vascular diseases. And the statistical analysis, they are used uh, using the kalper mayer uh, uh, techniques, and they had the difference assessed using the log rank test. And the first subgroup analysis, they had used the Fox pro proportional hazard model. So uh, coming to result and efficacy, they had uh, uh, noted that in total, uh, 317 people have developed a cardiovascular event in which 151 was taking aspirin and 166 were not. So this in which the, it is not clinically or statistically significant effect, you can see. So this is a kalpen uh, uh, uh Graph and it is a univariate uh, test and which uh, compares only the uh, as aspirin and the uh, non-aspirin group. Not it will exclude all other uh, confounding factors. So this uh, uh, graph clearly shows that the aspirin group, the people who is taking the aspirin, has the much uh, cumulative effect of the cardiovascular event even than the uh, people who is not taking on aspirin. This is for protocol analysis people uh, analysis study and uh, the people belong to that. Group. Then coming to intention to treat for heart. In, in, in this, we can clearly see uh, these two lines have been overlapped so that there is no uh, clinically significant difference we can see here. No, no uh, difference you can see. So uh, this uh, forest spot, we can see that the hazard ratio is uh, more than one and uh, it favors only the, for no aspirin group, not for the people who is taking on aspirin. Coming to the critical appraisal of the journal, title as such, it is very important in our society because the burden of the diabetes mellitus and this uh, related cardiovascular event in our country is huge. So the study is uh, very important and the settings they have chosen the university, medical college and hospitals and this article is published in AHA guidance. So the credibility of the article is really good and the author and appreciation is good and the outcome they have given a very detailed idea. Coming to the strengths of study, so it is an experimental long-term study. So the, all the inclusion and exclusion criteria are included, uh, sample randomization they had done, blinding done, and the outcomes that they had clearly explained. So it is an RCT study. So uh, the uh, in which, uh, uh, compared with the evidence level of study, it, uh, it comes at the level, level, level one. So reliability is good. And uh, for subgroup analysis, they had used the multivariable Cox proportional model. Uh, and for... Uh, 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 they had, and then even the sw switching has occurred for between the aspirin and the no aspirin group. They had documented it separately and studied separately. So the, all the errors have been reduced in that. And uh, these figures and tables are self-explanatory and are adequate. And they have been discussion part. They have uh, detailed discussed about the association between the diabetes mellitus and cardiovascular events, platelet dysfunction and aspirin resistance. Everything <coughs> they had detailed explained. And finally, they had concluded that uh, uh, this aspirin has no effect over uh, uh, cardiovascular event in type 2 diabetes mellitus, and uh, they had accepted the null hypothesis. Weakness of the study. So they had studied in Japanese race, but uh, this Japanese uh, race diet is different. So the, they per se, uh, the risk factor for the development of cardiovascular events is less when compared with Indian people. So this study should be this type of study should be conducted in our uh, country so that we can uh, uh, rely on the study. So it is since it is a long term study, it's very difficult to follow up. So at the end of study, only 64 percentage of the people has completed the study, and it is very expensive and a lot of resources are required. 
and the sample size when they started the study the sample size is adequate so as the loss of follow up is there uh, that is there is reduction in the sample size we, but, but we have to anticipate it when we take a long term study we have to anticipate this lo loss to follow up and then we have to take a uh, minimum of 30 to 40% increase in sample size means they had to cut around the 2500 people so we have, we have to take in 500 to 600 people in excess to avoid uh, uh, this errors so other factors like the usage of statins uh, in large doses in control group per se reduces the cardiovascular event so it acts as some confounding factor there my review about this article is so uh, they had statistical analysis very good and the study uh, they have proved it in very uh, a good manner but uh, uh, when we uh, uh, when we study the even the previous study uh, which, which is uh, england new uh, england study which is uh, very much reliable so the, they had proved the efficacy of aspirin over the cardiovascular Hey Malata, you're not audible. We we cannot hear you. Hey Malata, your audio is off. Please say a word at the end of this presentation, ma'am. Hello. She has lost connectivity. Considering uh, it is her last yeah, slide, yeah, you want that's to? Yeah, that's last slide. Can you yeah. can you stop slide share? Can somebody do that for me so that I can share my slide? Okay. Okay. Can I share yeah. my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Wait, John. Take it off. Take it off. Any other on the screen? Okay, right. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Let me talk about this Japanese study. All right. Hemrata has done a very good job, but there are some areas where we need to have clarity. This is also published in a good journal. Ethics clearance was obtained, informed consent was obtained. The type of study. This study is not a randomized control trial. Why? Because the randomized control trial was at the beginning for the first two years. After that, the people who were there in the randomized control trial were followed up for 10 years. By the time the code had been broken. So it is not a randomized control study anymore. The follow up will be a cohort study and the authors acknowledge that and this cohort study is no longer blinded okay it's not double blind it is only single blind only the people who were assessing the adverse outcome centrally they were blinded to what the patient was getting so it is open label single blind no placebo no placebo, all right, study. Uh, it's a randomized control trial, the initial three years, but then after that, the follow-up was just a cohort. The outcomes they were looking at were very, very relevant. Same as the NADM study. They were looking at vascular events, and they were looking at bleeding due to asthma. But I think it's a small problem. For the vascular event, they included hemorrhagic stroke. A hemorrhagic stroke should ideally be included <coughs> as bleeding attributable to acid. So I think there is an error there in their definition of primary outcome. Now, the strength of the study, 85% of people retain their original allocation right through up to 10 years. Only 15% change their allocation. But as Shemilata pointed out, only 64% were followed up for 10 years, okay? Only 64%. So a third of the patients were actually lost to follow-up. If you look at the patient characteristics, there are some additional characteristics that I would like to highlight. The mean age was 65. Mean diabetes duration was 7 years. Look at the mean HbA1c. It's a 7.4 to 7.5, which is a pretty decent diabetes control. 
and i disagree with hema she said satin news was different between the two groups it really is not the satin news was only 25% in one arm 26% in the other arm the difference was not statistically significant but if you compare it to the nadm study there people were 76% 76% were using uh, satin Sir, sorry, uh, sir, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Sir, I have come back. Sorry, sir. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you, sir. Yeah. It's it's only, go ahead. It was only the last slide. So, sir, yeah. did not the, the previous slide? slide? No, no, no. Slide? Yeah. No, 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 Stash. She yeah. is apologizing for the last slide that you could not present. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. No problem. Okay, yeah. Now, uh, Hemlata, you must look at this very carefully. You okay. said they assume a 30% reduction okay, would sorry. be there for calculating their sample size. But okay. all the prior evidence before the study with aspirin showed a much lower risk reduction, only about 10 to 15%. If you look at the NEJM study, they assumed a 15% reduction and they were right in using that. These people use the higher risk reduction. How does it matter? If you assume a higher level of risk reduction, you land up having a smaller sample size. And so, the study will not be powered to detect a difference of 15%. Okay? So, there's a problem. Now, the analysis, you said you complemented them on their analysis. You said per protocol, intention to treat and Cox proportional hazard model were all done, right? You know why? The intention to treat analysis would not have been actually possible with so many people not to follow. Number one. And number two, when they try to do the per protocol analysis, that is only people who stuck to the protocol, there were significant differences in baseline characteristics, which emerged. They are not there in the original randomization. And to make adjustment for these differences in baseline characteristics, they had to use a cost proportional hazard model to adjust for differences between them. So you need to understand that. Now, okay, now look at the outcome. There are three types of analysis that were done. But in all three analysis, you find that the 95% confidence interval crosses one. Okay, therefore, the vascular event reduction was not significant, regardless of what method of analysis of this. On the other hand, the gastrointestinal bleeding outcome was double in patients who received as 2% versus 0.9%. And that emerged as statistically significant. So what are the author's conclusion? Risk of gastrointestinal bleeding is significantly higher and low dose acid does not prevent vascular event. That is in Japanese patients. Okay? You pointed that out. That was very good. In Japanese yeah. patients, there is no sulfur acid for primary treatment. Even that, they can't give it confidence because they did not have a large enough sample to detect a 12 to 15 percent difference, which all that you can expect with acid. Okay? So the study is underpowered even for them to make that same. Okay. Okay, 30% risk reduction and realistic. If 10 to 15% risk reduction was postulated, you need much larger numbers. This is called a type 2 error. The study, as you pointed out, was exclusively Japanese population. We all know uh, that diet is different. They are miso soup, vegetables, fatty fish, and green tea as major constituents of the diet. They avoid red meat. And the typical Japanese diet has a cardioprotective effect. 
There is a higher life expectancy in Japan, probably the highest in the world. 87 in men and 82 in women. <laughs> Cardiovascular event rate is Japanese is only 1 to 2 per thousand, whereas it is 4 per thousand in India. Gasital bleeding mm. in Japanese on Roto Astrid is estimated to be 2.5 per thousand, and that's a little higher than in other parts of the world. So, with the extrapolation of the results of these Japanese studies to other populations, in particular to our country, is not possible. Okay? Right. Now, I think we are uh, nearing the end of the session. Do we change our practice on the basis of these two studies? Okay. Now, that's a very important question to ask. That is answered by the meta analysis, which was published in 2019, comprising 15 randomized control trials, 83,000 in the asteroid arm, 81,000 in the no asteroid arm. Now, you look at all the events, non fatal MI, DIA, ischemic stroke, all of them were significantly lower in the asteroid arm. And the number needed to freeze to prevent one event was I to 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 now. Major bleed hmm. was significantly more often seen in Africa, hmm. and the number needed to harm was 222 for gas and hemorrhage. Hmm. And now, Sesh, you need to unmute. You need to unmute you. Sesh, you need to unmute. Yeah, 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 yeah unmute. Yeah. Okay. Something has happened here. Uh, let me. Yeah, that's about it. It's our last slide. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, that, that, that was the last slide. Okay. Okay. Now, I just want to point out that during the journal of session, we have really seen all types of intervention studies. This is called the evidence pyramid. At the bottom, you have just got expert opinion, which is the least reliable. And after that, case support, case series, you had a case series or set woman. Then you have a cross sectional study. One of the studies on Centromat will qualify for that. You saw a cohort study, the Japanese follow-up study on aspirin and vascular events for the cohort study. You saw two randomized control trials, one open label with Centromat, and one was a double-blind randomized control trial on aspirin published in the New England Journal. Now, all these studies give you unfiltered information. That means people have not sat and analyzed it. You are just seeing the author's work. Now, this same information can be filtered by others and can be converted into a systematic review with large numbers. Now, currently, well-performed systematic reviews are at the top of the evidence pyramid. Okay. So I gave an example of that. How the opinion would change depending upon whether you are going to use one trimester, two trimester, or whether you use to use the meta. Now, even after this, extrapolation to our country actually is a little difficult problem because in India we know diabetes. Vascular, related vascular disease occurs at a much younger age group, is more severe. And unlike all these studies where diabetes control is HPLC of 7.2, 7.4, the average HPLC in our Indian subject with diabetes more likely to be somewhere of 8.59. Okay. So you cannot extrapolate these results to our country, but you probably need to do a multi-center trial in India 
and if several yeah. medical colleges put their heads together, we yeah. actually can do it because we have a lot of diabetes. And as it is not very expensive, you just require careful and meticulous follow up of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, we have seen very, very large randomized trials, like uh, uh, the last two, in including 15,000, uh, 7,000 uh, people. I, usually, when you are looking at a very common condition and you want a, uh, an on, and uh, your, you and management of a very common condition, uh, you need to actually study a large number of patients. Let us say postpartum hemorrhage and mesoprostol, it had 25,000 patients. So uh, these kind of studies actually uh, are very helpful in making very, very major decisions regarding management of our patients. When you start off, with your research as a postgraduate, it is not necessary to, while these articles are very interesting to read, you will have to ask your question and start off with a small pilot study where you will certainly learn how to plan a study, how to ask a question, how to plan a study, uh, to decide on what kind of study you want to do. Is it going to be, uh, you know, is it a evaluation of a diagnostic test? Is it uh, uh, evaluation or uh, intervention, decide on how, what, how to randomize, how to blind, and finally, how to calculate odds ratios, relative risks, etc. And uh, I think these are the things we hope you would have learned from this session with us. None of you are going to be, the postgraduates especially, are going to be able to uh, critically analyze articles tomorrow. This needs a lot of practice. You need to go through journal clubs, read a lot of articles, and of course, it will at one point in time uh, kind of dawn on you as to how exactly this should be done. It takes time, but yes, practice makes perfect. Thank you. The three of you presented very well. Sonia, Deepak, and Hemalata. Thanks yeah, for I, this. Yeah, I, I, would, I would like to compliment the three students who presented uh, the articles, they had shown a lot of interest, have put in a lot of work. And I must say that I have not seen postgraduates who are presenting journal club infrequently present in such a good way. I think I think you have done a good job, but I think you learn as you go along. That's very important. Okay. Okay. Thank you, madam and sir. Uh, we do have journal clubs monthly in the Department of Pediatrics, and likewise, they must be having in the Department of Anesthesia. Absolutely, and, I think so too. And, uh, uh, yes, obstetrics and gynecology too. It has become a norm now to have that as per NMC or MCA as it used to be. And now uh, it has been a very novel, interesting and modified version of Journal Club, such a large forum today. And uh, there have been carefully chosen articles, contradictory. So, so much comes in the web and we are all totally confused as to uh, which has got credence and which does not have. So, you've rightly shown us the way as to uh, how to decide which articles to go by. Uh, starting from whether it is a, uh, a good journal or not and to the sample size and so many points to go about before we take the uh, message, key message, whether it is valid or not. So commendable analysis uh, by the PGs too in their own capacity, which have been uh, corrected and uh, chiseled out by the two speakers of the day. And as I was looking at the chat frequently, the compliments have been pouring in from uh, Dr. Boomer, HOD of Pediatrics, Dr. Balavinkar, Dr. Ashok, Dr. Sajini, and so many others. Kudos to all presenters, pa panelists, for their venture. Uh, from the audience, the pick would be ready to take them. Are there any questions from yeah. the panelists or others? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Sumati. 
Yes, uh, I'm Dr. Samadhi. I'm a primary, uh, I'm a family physician in UK. Just wanted to uh, just give a feedback on aspirin and uh, uh, primary prevention or secondary prevention use of aspirin in diabetic patients. We used to use uh, aspirin in, as primary prevention in diabetic patients uh, for cardiovascular disease prevention. That was several years ago. But since then, we have stopped using aspirin in primary prevention in diabetic patients because of increased risk of uh, GI bleed in those patients. And uh, now, um, also, ca cardiovascular disease is only common in the middle age and the later age groups. And uh, the middle age and later age groups are at increased risk of GI bleed, as we all know. And uh, the diabetic patients are also at increased risk of retinal hemorrhage because they quite often have a, a diabetic retinopathy and aspirin increases the risk of retinal hemorrhages. So we don't use that for that reason. And um, it is now being used as in secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease and stroke and TAAs. Um, the other thing is the only place where we use uh, anti uh, anticoagulants like DOAC and NOAC drugs are uh, used in primary prevention of atrial fibrillation and that too with uh, uh, gastric protection uh, with uh, lansoprazole or omeprazole. Uh, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, these articles were actually chosen to give a spectrum of articles for the students rather than to emphasize the current practice in UK about which we are just telling. Uh, the number needed to treat and the number needed to half are evenly matched. Okay, so I can understand why practitioners in UK would not use aspirin as primary prevention. But still, I would say in a country like India, where the kind of vascular disease that occurs in diabetes, the idea merits a research study, multi study, before we discard it. And in India, use of PPI is very widely prevalent, okay, and it's not extensive, and therefore it might be possible to take away the GI bleed element in aspirin use. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. For giving your and for good puts. And now is Dr. Prabha, our vice principal, there to debrief the session. Geeta, are you able to hear me, ma'am? Yes, yes, able to hear. It's my, it's my great pressure and gives me immense euphoria to be with you uh, with all the finest throughout this webinar. And I would admit on behalf of the CMC that the postgraduates are really benefited by this webinar. And I thank Madam and Sir uh, the, uh, for teaching our students uh, how to analyze uh, the, any article in depth uh, through this platform. I thank Dr. Shokma Sir, Dr. Ajay Balavingit Sir, Dr. Ramalingam Sir, and Dr. Bhutanjali Madam for, uh, for coordinating and organizing this webinar. And thank you all once again, ma'am. Geeta. Thank you, Dr. Prabha. Madam. Uh, Geeta, uh, it's a good, uh, good presentation by our PGs. Indeed, uh, it will uh, refine our, their skills still more, I think so. Uh, thank Global Alumni for having, a, having done a, such a wonderful presentation to our PGs. Uh, thank you, Ashok sir, and uh, other uh, coordinators, uh, Dr. Ramlingam sir, and uh, Dr. Geeta, and uh, Dr. Malavengat. Uh, thank you, one and all. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thanks from all of us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, on behalf of the uh, academic uh, committee, I would like to 
uh, uh, thank uh, Dr. Shashadri and Dr. Lashmi for uh, making it a uh, very, very uh, memorable day for the PGs. They have been so uh, critical and uh, as well as uh, guiding the PGs how to analyze an article. It's uh, so nice to see that uh, both the groups are uh, uh, gelled so well. And uh, thank you so much for uh, making it a very memorable day. I'm looking forward to many more such uh, journal clubs and uh, to Dr. Nirmala. I assure that uh, we will definitely involve the HODs of uh, the concerned departments in forthcoming events and they can moderate or they can be a panelist and uh, whatever uh, we choose to do. And uh, let us uh, join hands to make our younger generation medicos more confident and more uh, uh, research oriented, more analytical oriented. And uh, we are all looking forward to many more such uh, uh, webinars. Thank you, one and all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, Thank you. Before, we, before we end with end this session, we have a small overview of ProQuest by Dr. Mohan Kumar, the know-how of ProQuest. Is he there? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, yeah, Dr. Mohan Kumar, SPS 1993. He did his master's in public health. He serves at the Directorate of Public Health and Preventive Medicine. He has done a diploma in bioethics. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, madam, for this so wonderful opportunity. And uh, I am so overwhelmed by the time given to you. I uh, I know I will not take more than five minutes. I wish to walk through. Uh, the availability of ProQuest and uh, how you all can access the ProQuest because literature search, literature review is an important part of research and advanced learning. And you need a content uh, search and you need a place to search your uh, articles and other uh, study materials. So I can share my screen. I hope my screen is available to you all. Yeah, so this is our website and thanks to our alumni association to develop a wonderful website. And uh, the website ID is called cbemcglobalalumni.org, which means CBE is Coimbatore, MC is Medical College and Global Alumni is the alumni name. And it is .org, it's our organization. So when you try to, when you, when you enter this ID in the address, uh, you will land up in the homepage. So the homepage has a lot of materials, a uh, lot of information about our alumni association, but I want you to focus on the two yellow buttons here. One, we have this member login, another we have this register now. Uh, so for, for all who are landing this page for the first time and trying to register and access ProQuest, I recommend you to go to the register now page and do a registration. For, for already registered members, we can go for this member login. Okay, there's a question called like who, who all can register? Uh, any individual who, has, who is an alumni of Pantry Medical College from 1966 batch are eligible to have a registration. And uh, this, this particular effort is for our current officers, current uh, doctors and the, uh, the faculty. So, uh, we have a faculty drop-down menu and also the current students, both UG and PG. And I, I personally wish and recommend like all the teachers and the current students, both UG and PG can do their registration in the registration of button and they can access the request. Before I want, I walk you through the ProQuest registration. I, I wish to gather your attention to a tab called e-library. When you, when you see the tab at the top of this website, we have a menu called e-library. We go and click the e-library. If it's loading, if you can see, there are many available resources that is already mapped. Except the protest where you need to have a login, all the other materials are free for uh, access, we basically try to map in the available study materials uh, that are available free to access across the internet and map here. For example, if you wanted to like access some medical uh, books, there are, we can see all the 
uh, basic books available as a PDF version. You can go and have a download, and uh, and we can have as a PDF version to refer to. It's available for all the thirteen major subjects and even uh, nine minor subjects here. Okay. So and of course the main part is the progress. Now, so when you land on the home page and to access the progress, definitely you need to register because progress is a Mm, paid uh, database and uh, and thanks to our entire team who spend a lot of uh, you know effort and money in getting the progress okay so so let's go to the registration page i'm just trying to click this registration page and this is the mandated form that comes it's a small form okay and the first is the email id so we try to give our email id that is a unique uh, address to enter into the request and that will become your username and then we have a password you can choose any password which is at least eight characters uh, that has an uppercase and lowercase and a character and the number then you have the name and you have gender as a drop down menu and we have country the people in the, in the people who are like uh, you should choose the india and others can uh, feel free to choose and we have uh, the code it is plus 91 for india Another can choose say code zero one for US and the phone number address address uh, please go ahead and fill your address and the same degree. So those who are already completed they can do the completed degree. Those who are the UG can still do what degree they are doing. They do MBBS as soon as they do like MBBS here and with the speech they can do MBBS as MD and blah blah. And again of course in in speciality so this is a small database we want to maintain. If you click, there are available specialties already, and we are trying try to map all the major specialties. And definitely, if you cannot find your own specialty, you can still pick others and just continue your registration. If you have two major specialties, you can click here, and such a second specialty will be coming. So, for example, if you are in uh, about both the specialties, you can very well pick two specialties. If not, you can remove it. This is a very important point which I want. The current associate with CMC is like you may be an undergraduate, you are near postgraduate, you can be a faculty, you can be a past faculty, and an alumni. So there may be like you may be alumni and also a faculty. Uh, so then you can so you have to choose only one. So I prefer if you can choose alumni and and here the UG postgraduate and the faculty. It menu is available for us to pick and register news. Okay, you can choose a drop down menu, and this this is an area of the interest and expectations from the alumni. We purposely kept these two boxes for us to know what exactly the member wants to understand. We want to understand more about uh, research, more about uh, uh, some area of interest. We will try to provide that information by a seminar and a CME. So you, we have to just register. So only once you register, you will receive an OTP to email, and you can even uh, do the OTP and OTP and login. So let us. I will walk through an already a login. So I have. I'm already logged in. I will. Uh, Hello. Hello. So we go and login, and we will we will end up in the dashboard. This particular dashboard has many features. There is an update profile. You can very well go click here and change your profile. Whatever you already entered, that will be up, 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 that will be coming here. And you, you can change the password if you wanted to change the password. And if you wanted to change your profile picture, if you wanted to put a photo, definitely you can upload a photograph here. And um, yeah, and you can. If you wanted to share some article to us to put in the newsletter, put it in the website, we can submit an article here. And this we have kept to understand who, if you wanted to meet other people, other colleagues in your own batch, or other specialty in across the batches, you can use this new batches, which this is under development currently. And you can even contribute some contents for the newsletter website. If you click here, then a menu opens, stating that you can type, you can put a title, and you can paste the content. You can upload an upload and document, which we can use this for a website or into a newsletter. And of course, we have this request. So let, let me click the request. When you click the request, then a new page opens, and 
this is the landing page and where you will have an authentication to enter into purpose. So we have to just click, click here to access. And then you land in the official progress website of our alumni. And if you can see this access is provided by Quantum Medical College. So this request is available for access by any individual who has an association with our Quantum Medical College. He may be an alumni, he may be a teacher, he may be a student. And uh, of course, we will be sending you videos how to use progress. But it is very simple. You have a search button straight on the landing page. If you are interested in a particular journal, article, or a topic, you just type. For example, if you type midcore mycosis, that is your interest. Just midcore mycosis and search, and you will have all the latest available uh, publications in midcore mycosis. And, uh, and you can have uh, your relevance and other what is available last 15 months, five years. And then you have a drop down menu with the progress to this for the three months from this. And uh, of course, then, if, for example, if you click click this fungal disease and look at the courses that's published, published already here, and so this you have the free content to access, and you can download the entire PDF here. So, this request has access to 4,500 journals through articles. For major mini journals, there may be a uh, you know, layer time of about one month to three months where we will have only abstract initially and uh, we will be having access for the entire uh, publication after that, that particular period. But still, uh, you can have major research articles that is available. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in addition to this particular uh, searches, you have journal, journals, you have books, and of course, you have videos and art, uh, audios if you have like hot murmurs. And uh, there will be a lot of videos uh, available in hot murmurs, and uh, uh, you can uh, you can search it, uh, certainly do this. Um, I'm trying to pick an uh, uh, microbiology. And if you see, the audio and video work, you have this therapeutic biotechs and click there's a video which is telling about therapeutic products. And uh, there are around 45,000 videos available for us to understand the basic sciences. So the purpose is not only helping you to find the uh, uh, published journals, it also gives books, it also gives videos and audios, and also dissertation and thesis and much more. So. I, I recommend please choose the request and uh, in your literacy search. You can even build your profile here and also store your journals that you have searched and try to use it. And Progress also helps you to uh, learn the uh, uh, reference managers. There are there are three major reference managers that is used by Progress. Uh, one is Mandalay, another is Jotiru, and third is Enno. So if whenever you have time, just browse through the request and ensure you learn you learn all these things that will really help you in using uh, these facilities available in our association and uh, build your research upon. And uh, uh, the last point which I wanted to tell you is that few of you have already registered your uh, membership in uh, Excel sheet uh, and also in the Google form. We will send you a special request for you to bypass the form registration so that you can access with your already registered email ID, which we can send in, uh, send a separate email for us to the instruction. Yeah, I stop here and wish to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, over to your touch with Anjali. Thank you, Assessor. Um, um, a good um, um, rundown how to get into the ProQuest and also use the website. Uh, for those who still have difficulty, uh, will there be a help desk or how do they um, resolve the issues?
thank you asaf sir and uh, i am available uh, any time for any questions please reach reach us or any any of the sobi team and uh, we are happy to help you in all the issues that you are facing in the uh, podcast and uh, accessing the website and please let us know if you wanted to populate any information the website and uh, we assure you that any information regarding the notification of the meetings or uh, or uh, some advertisements or uh, putting some information will be available in the website within 24 hours of uh, sending to us thank you Oh, thank you, Dr. Mohan Kumar, for that explanation. We already registered, and it was quite an easy access only. And I tried to access one journal too, and I got on aspirin and cerebrovascular accident, and I could easily get uh, access to about five thousand articles. And I, I think I will pursue that. Thank you. Thank you, madam. So I think it was an eventful day today, and uh, we made our day. that's what i can say in just a single sentence thank you all for the entire proceedings to have been with me thank you thank you ma'am thank you thank you so thanks all i think uh, shall we conclude sir yeah yes good, yes, good, yes. The, sure, the final word is uh, kudos to the pgs and um, uh, great thanks uh, big thanks to dr sashadri and lakshmi Okay, thank you all participants. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you all presenters and Dr. Sheshadri and yeah. Mrs. Sheshadri. Thank you. Thank you all. I really had thank a nice you. time interacting bye. with you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.